You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from RAND. I'm Deanna Lee. And I'm Evan Banks. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from RAND's latest research and commentary. It's August 23rd. If COVID-19 was a test of the world's ability to defend against new pathogens, then humanity failed. That's according to Roger Brent of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, RAND researcher Greg McKelvey Jr., and RAND president and CEO Jason Matheny. Writing in Foreign Affairs this week, they called humanity's failure during the pandemic sobering because the world is facing a growing number of biological threats. Some of these threats come from nature, but plenty come from scientific advances. Over the past 60 years, researchers around the world have developed sophisticated understandings of molecular and human biology. These advances have allowed for the development of remarkably deadly and effective pathogens. In laboratory settings, researchers have figured out how to create viruses that can evade immunity. They've learned how to evolve existing viruses to spread more easily through the air, and how to engineer viruses to make them more deadly. In short, Brent McKelvey and Matheny say it's clear that biological technology, now boosted by artificial intelligence, has made it simpler than ever to produce diseases. And if bad actors eventually use such technology to produce and release a viral pathogen, it could infect vast swaths of the population in far less time than it would take officials to detect and identify the threat and start fighting back. Fortunately, there are steps that authorities can take to address these risks. They can construct systems that can rapidly develop vaccines, antiviral drugs, and other medical interventions. Policymakers can also take steps to make it harder for pathogens to spread. They could start by creating bigger stockpiles of personal protective equipment now. Masks, gloves, and respirators are key to stopping virus transmission, so officials should sign preparatory contracts for such items. And there's one final way to reduce the risk of biological disasters, one that goes beyond plotting responses and defenses. That is for officials to better govern new technologies. In fact, this may be the only way to actually prevent a mass biological attack, the authors say. Governance could include denying funding to or even outright banning particular experiments, requiring that people and facilities obtain licenses before carrying out certain kinds of work, or being more thorough in overseeing future lab automation. Officials could also require that firms selling anything used to make biological agents adopt know-your-customer rules, which would require companies to confirm their customers' identities and the nature of their activities. Preventing and responding to biological attacks will be a defining challenge of the 21st century, say Brent, McKelvey, and Matheny. But officials should not despair. After all, the world has avoided existential catastrophe before, and it can do so again. With its bold ground offensive into the southern Kursk region of Russia, Ukraine appears to have the initiative against its enemy. And according to Rand's John Gentile and Adam Givens, in war, as military history shows, initiative is everything. In a new commentary, Gentile and Givens break down past examples of this kind of bold risk-taking that may be helpful to Ukraine. One such example is George Washington's Delaware River crossing in the fall of 1776. Rather than retreating after his army suffered a demoralizing defeat at the Battle of Long Island, Washington crossed the frozen Delaware and caught the enemy off guard by attacking two outposts at Princeton and Trenton. This proved more than a tactical defeat for the British. It allowed Washington's army to seize the initiative. This newfound confidence would remain for the rest of the war. Another case is General Douglas MacArthur's amphibious landing at Incheon during the Korean War in 1950. 
In this operation, combined U.S. forces retook the South Korean coastal city of Incheon three months after North Korea's invasion had pushed Republic of Korea and U.S. forces all the way south. This was a risky move that worked, but afterward, a highly confident MacArthur pressed on, disregarding clear intelligence, indicating that the Chinese army was likely to enter the war to prevent U.N. forces from uniting the peninsula under South Korean authority. China did just that, and by 1951, the war stalemated. For Ukraine, the lesson from MacArthur is don't allow initial success from an audacious military action to generate unchecked confidence. Don't become so convinced of your proficiency that you disregard the capabilities and intentions of your enemy. So, Ukraine's audacity has generated a bold advantage. If Kyiv follows its risky operation with obtainable objectives, then it can still win its war against the Russian invaders. Last summer was the hottest on record, and 2024 looks to be hotter still. When temperatures become extreme, air conditioning provides temporary relief and helps prevent illnesses and deaths. Moreover, compound climate events, such as simultaneous heat waves and wildfires that make opening windows unhealthy, make access to air conditioning essential. But AC is a double-edged sword, says Rand's Lena East in Calabria. Most AC units run on electricity generated by burning fossil fuels. That leads to more emissions and, consequently, further contributes to higher global temperatures and more frequent heat waves. That's why current AC strategies must be understood as a necessary band-aid, not as a lasting solution. Building resilience to extreme heat requires multi-pronged efforts, and a balance of immediate and long-term strategies. For example, transitioning to renewable energy, such as solar, can break the current air conditioning feedback loop. Urban green infrastructure and nature-based solutions, such as trees, parks, and landscape features that deal with stormwater runoff, can dramatically cool temperatures while also increasing pollinator habitats, improving water quality, and providing social and economic benefits. These efforts can help lower temperatures, which means that air conditioners won't have to expend as much energy, fossil fuel or otherwise, to cool the indoors. Initiating behavioral changes at scale could also help. For example, schedules could be adapted so that people work during cooler parts of the day and rest during peak heat. This would reduce heat exposure and demand on the electrical grid. In turn, it could help lower the likelihood of blackouts that amplify heat mortality and morbidity. Efforts such as these would propel the transition from coping mechanisms to sustainable adaptation, helping to protect short-term and long-term health. Otherwise, there's a risk of becoming ever more reactive to extreme temperatures without tackling the root cause. And that would only worsen global warming in the process. As the U.S. presidential election draws near, the threat of political violence is very real. In fact, says Rand's Brian Michael Jenkins, not since 1968, a year marked by assassinations, division, and widespread rioting, has the threat loomed so large. Fortunately, there are ways that federal, state, and local officials can safeguard candidates, election workers, voters, and the electoral process at the heart of American democracy. Authorities can start by collecting intelligence and devising plans for a range of disruptive scenarios, including attacks on candidates, actions aimed at disrupting voting, and attacks on or near polling places. Full-time election safety task forces could be established to devise responses to such scenarios. State-level fusion centers may be another valuable tool. Fusion centers focus on assembling, assessing, and communicating threats to key stakeholders. They could also involve cyber teams, red teaming, tabletop simulations, and field training exercises. Playbooks could draw on the Fusion Center's work and a re-examination of existing law to guide authorities from the state level down to the polling station level. Chains of command should be established, public hotlines set up, and press strategies devised. 
This kind of planning and preparation will go a long way toward making U.S. elections safer. But according to Jenkins, law enforcement can do little to end the threat if Americans can't agree on the need to rid the political process of violence, fear, and intimidation. Quote, Ultimately, protecting the fundamental right of Americans to vote safely will require a commitment from the electorate writ large. Democracy can only truly be preserved if Americans reject violence and those who promote it. That's it for this week's episode. If you'd like to learn more about what we discussed today, check out the show notes at rand.org slash podcast. We're off next Friday ahead of the Labor Day weekend, but we'll be back in your feeds on September 6th. We'll see you then. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision-making through research and analysis.